the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please rise. We're probably going to, when we, without an organist, we'll have to be patient with, with the music. It's a little tough to stay uh, uh, with it, but that's okay. Hymn 262 in the blue. service this morning is found on page 25 of your blue hymnal. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is the Lord who made heaven and earth. Progressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Whereupon we come for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives power to become the sons of God, and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Amen. You may be seated. The reading this morning. Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. 
Genesis chapter 17, beginning at the verse, first verse. Abraham and the covenant of circumcision. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you. And kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan. For an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. That's the end of our first lesson. Our second lesson comes from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Titled, Made Alive in Christ, beginning at the first verse. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, too, are formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast." Here ends our second lesson for this morning. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The gospel this morning is taken from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 9. Matthew 9, 9 through 13, the calling of Matthew. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not healthy, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Here ends the gospel reading for this morning.
Please join with me as we confess the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 23 of your blue hymnal. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated in preparation for the message, hymn 561 in the Blue Hymnal.
Good morning. Every time that uh, we as lay, lay people are asked to give the message, I get a true appreciation. I have a true appreciation for what pastors do. The, this is extremely difficult to do in, in preparation, so they put a, a, a tremendous amount of time and work in uh, preparing for what God has laid on their hearts for, for the week. So we definitely need to appreciate pastors for, for their work in their ministry and proclaiming the gospel. This morning I've, I've chosen Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 in our pericope, uh, subtitled Saved by Grace, uh, some have made alive in Christ. So that's the passage we're going to look at this morning. Before we start, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that, that uh, you have before us, that we can come and study your word, O oh Lord, and that you reveal to us the message that you have before us. And, and we just thank you for this opportunity. And we just pray, O oh Lord, for we think of Pastor and Hannah this morning, and we pray that you would bless them and their time off here. And, and we just pray your anointing upon uh, the call that you have for him, and we just pray, O oh Lord, that, that the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ goes out into the airwaves this day. And now, O oh Lord, we just pray that the, the words of my mouth and the, the meditation of our hearts here this morning will be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. October 12, 1975. I don't know if anybody knows that date or not. The, the day was unlike any other Sunday. At the age of 15, the weekend, more specifically Sunday, involved seeking out and being with friends to pass the time. So one time I was young, Benjamin. On, the, on this specific Sunday, however, the local church devoted the day to celebrating and enjoying its annual mission festival. But this Sunday would soon turn out to be different. As the evening progressed, news of a tragic car accident on the south edge of town began filtering its way through the Mission Festival participants. Overhearing an adult's conversation revealed that a young man had lost his life in the accident. As pieces of the story poured, poured in, it soon brought to light that the young man's name was none other than Jim Hooks. For those that didn't know Jim... He was one of the most popular young men in the, in the local school system, one of those unique individuals blessed with a great future ahead of him, a great personality, fun, outgoing, as well as a tremendous athlete. Claiming the accident as a tragic loss would be a huge understatement, to say the least, as just a few hours earlier that day, that afternoon many of us gathered and had the privilege of enjoying some time sharing laughs and stories with Jim at the local establishment. For a 15-year-old, this would be the first personal experience of death involving not only a young individual, but a classmate and friend. 45 years later, thoughts of that day still come to mind. Each of us here can look back and make claim to experiencing tragic situations that are per permanently burned in our minds. So much so that many of us can name the date, time, and location of where we were when we too received word of a tragedy involving a loss of life. What these personal loss of life experiences reveal to us is just how fragile, temporary, and valuable our lives really are to those around us as a difficult event called death can whisk away a vibrant life in a blink of an eye. So the passage this morning, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, provides for its readers a greater, clearer understanding as to what the truth of the gospel is. God's eternal purpose and grace sent forth through Christ so that all who believe become righteous, living, saved, and free from the law, sin, and death. So let's look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. We we read that this morning in our, in our, uh, in our uh, lessons, but we will read it again. Made alive in Christ, Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions 
and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In the early chapters leading up to this passage of Romans, in this passage, Rome, the, the Apostle Paul sets the stage in dealing with the darkness of man that results in God's wrath and righteous judgment on all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth. And what is the truth? Paul goes on to say that for although they, man, knew God, they neither glorified him or gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's in Romans 8. The Bible says that men are without excuse in that God's invisible qualities, the eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen in his creation. And you can find that in Romans 1.18. James 4.14 challenges those who place their hope and trust in tomorrow, further saying why you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? Your life, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. In the reading for today, the Apostle Paul walks us through who we are, who we were apart from Christ, who we are now with Christ, and who we will be in the final victory with Christ. Paul begins the passage of who we once were, painting an ugly portrait of fallen men, revealing to us the great depth of sin in our wretched lives being spiritually dead, completely separated from God. Verse 1 personalizes it a bit, emphasizing the word you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, dead because of sin, totally opposite compared to Almighty God, Christ Jesus who knew no sin, being perfect, righteous and holy and expecting nothing less of man. No one knew this better than Paul. Paul, of all people, knew full well the depths of the depravity of man as he sought to destroy the church, violently persecuting the Christian community before meeting Jesus on the road to, to Damascus. For us today, we can relate with Paul, not in the persecution of Christians, but as he addresses his struggle with sin in Romans 7. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Many today claim and put their trust in being a good person and living a quiet life that will hopefully be rewarded by God on the last day. Moving on to verse 3, verse 3 describes that all of us, all of us from conception craved our sin, sinful nature, a nature full of its lusts, deeds, and appetites for sinful satisfaction that ultimately brings about God's wrath. God's wrath the ultimate reaction of his almighty holiness and righteousness against all that is sinful. Not a shred of loveliness exists in man through Adam. 
Lenski provides a powerful image of God's wrath to those that don't believe, describing it to a fire when it touches tinder. Hebrews 12 describes God as a consuming fire. So is there any hope for us that walk this earth? But in verse 4, God enters the picture, entering on behalf of his chosen people. I have in my office prints of the Minneapolis artist Terry Redlin. And I don't know if anybody has any of these prints or not, but Terry Redlin has beautiful portraits, and he's really popular for his outdoor and waterfowl paintings. And for any of those who you have seen them, one thing that really stands out, and a lot of them are either in the morning or dusk, well, one theme's constant, that light shining through the darkness and showing the beauty of God's creation. Paul, in his passage, provides its readers a portrait of a bright light, a light shining and piercing the darkness for those who place their hope and trust in Christ Jesus, a sure hope for fallen man in the proclamation of God's great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. This passage also provides two clear pictures for us to consider. The first one, you and I being dead and lost forever in our sin. And God, who is alive, righteous, and rich. God enters, changing the game from death to life, from enslavement to freedom, from darkness to light, from despair to hope, from being an object of wrath to an object of of love. What a marvelous thing that is before our eyes of what God has done for you and I, making us alive in Christ. Lansky goes on and describes that this thing called grace is an absolutely astounding event that will ever remain the most wondrous and glorious mystery that will never be understood by the human mind. The first verse in chapter 1 of Ephesians states that he chose us in him before the creation of of the world to what? To be holy and blameless in his sight. Verse 4 continues, it is grace that you have been saved. God's undeserved love that is extended to us sinners in all our filthiness, guilt and shame, and ultimately the pardoning that guilt and the penalty of death. All for the sake of who? Christ Jesus alone. So God is rich in mercy and full of compassion. A couple Sundays back, Pastor's message from 2 Samuel 24 depicted a great picture of God's mercy for his people. For the Lord in delivering his wrath was ultimately grieved from the plagues sent to the Israelites eventually relenting from destroying his people, with David standing in their place to take the punishment for their sins. And I would encourage everybody to read uh, 2 Samuel 24. It's a great picture, of beautiful picture of Christ found in the Old Testament. Out of his great mercy and compassion, he sent his one and only son, described in Romans 5.8, that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And not only died for us and saved us from the wretched world, but culminating in a seat at the table with God Almighty, providing a guarantee that we will be raised up with Him and be seated with Him in heaven in whom? Again, in Christ Jesus alone. So with all the great news that has just been laid out before us, let us not think or convince ourselves that any of us here have anything to do with our salvation. The common thread here to keep in mind is that all of these spiritual benefits and gifts are delivered by God via a one-way path from heaven to earth through Christ. Paul clarifies this for his readers in verse 8, totally eliminating any confusion on the subject saying that you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Works count for nothing. So faith is the key. What is faith under the definition of man? Interesting account of, of a cleaning salesman that showed up to our bank and gave his great spiel on, on a cleaning agent and went through all clean everything. And at the end, and better, most importantly, it's so safe that you could drink it. So not letting this, this one go by, one of the staff members says, okay, go ahead. Uh, the salesman obviously had faith in his product but asking, you really want me to drink it? He didn't have that much faith in his product. The Bible declares that faith is absolutely essential in attaining one's salvation. Christ desires that all people be saved. And he pleads not only for the disciples, but his people in John 14, 11, to believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Are we saved by faith? No, we are saved through faith. Big difference. Faith is a conduit through which God's grace is delivered to us. Delivered to us through the means of grace, its sacraments and the word. The third article to the Apostles' Creed defines faith as believing that I cannot by my own Reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the truth faith. In the same way, He calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, He daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. And what is the meaning end to it? This is most certainly true. For us to receive faith, there first has to be the knowledge of what God has, has said. But let's be clear, God creates faith. There is no decision on the part of you and I in this process. It is not about any special type of faith. It's not about rituals, morals, lifestyles, not even faith in yourself. Doing good works is not a condition for our salvation. Rather, it is the result of our salvation. Faith and the results of God's perfect will is only in Christ alone. That is why it's important to wipe off the dust and read the Bible and attend church each Sunday to hear God's Word. Romans describes the gift of faith in chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. How else are people saved if they, are not, if they cannot hear the message? Very important point. But unfortunately, many are either too busy or walk away claiming the Bible and the messages from the pulpit are too confusing to allow full understanding of what the Bible and the message is saying. It's an unfortunate reality, but not one that we give up on. Verse 10 expounds further why we were saved. It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In verse 8, Paul uses the word you. But here, Paul uses we and us. God's salvation is for all mankind. We are all created in Christ Jesus, and through him, we are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, a new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. The word handiwork 
means that we are God's masterpiece. We were dead, enslaved and condemned. But God made us alive, forgiving all our sins. God made us a new creation and included us in His marvelous plan of salvation. That was not a random act, but orchestrated and prepared in advance at the beginning of time for His glory. So when is the time for us to consider this grace and faith that leads towards salvation? The great evangelist Billy Graham always impressed on his viewers that time is of the essence when looking at one's salvation. He would make clear to those present that tomorrow is full of pitfalls and that one may never have another chance to turn their life over to Christ. His statement to those present was always to come to Christ today. For today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. So what about you? Is eternity worth rolling the dice and putting off today and waiting for tomorrow? We have personally seen this before our eyes, that tomorrow is truly fleeting. In summary, without Christ, we are dead, dead in our transgressions. However, Christ has demonstrated raising to life those once dead, not only in his miracles here on earth, but on the cross. God made us alive with Christ so that our eyes would be open and see in person the incomparable riches of God's grace, so much so that we should desire to put feet to the gospel and share the great news with our neighbors. Paul presents this charge in 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 12. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Ours is the ultimate victory in Christ Jesus. Praise be to God. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for this message. We just thank you for the grace that you have bestowed upon us and for coming into our lives. And help us, O oh Lord, to be a shining light to those around us and help us to be instruments to your calling, O oh Lord. And we just thank you for this opportunity, O oh Lord, and for your message in Jesus' name. We will now have the offering for the Sunday morning. Please rise for prayer. Father God, we just thank you for, again, for this day that you have set aside to worship, honor, and praise you, O Lord. And we just thank you, O Lord, for your grace that you have showered upon us, O Lord, for your mercy and for faith, O Lord, for coming into our lives through the Holy Spirit to bring faith into your people, O Lord. And we just pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you would call each one of us as an open vessel to that call to proclaim that, that word, O oh Lord, the salvation that you bring, O oh Lord, and the word of Jesus Christ to the world. And we just pray, O oh Lord, that, that our paths be 
bright lights, O oh Lord, for those around us and that you would provide that path, O oh Lord, and bring others in our paths to witness to in the weeks to come. Father, we lift up to you this day and, and, and we just thank you for fathers, O oh Lord, uh, for the Father's Day that, that we have. Thank you for godly men in, in this country, O oh Lord. And we just pray, O oh Lord, that, that you would increase those numbers, O oh Lord, and that you would fan the flame of revival in this country in a world hurting for, for you and for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for those with health concerns. We, we think of those on our hearts and we think of those in our bulletin, Lauren, Donovan, Charles, Connie, Alan, Don, Delane, Dave, Roger, Janelle, Mark, James, Judy, Steve, Christy, Rusty, Lanny, Colby. We think of those in the nursing homes, Ed Ranke and Helen. We think of those that are pregnant. We think of Hannah Lee, Emily Ron, Lydia Hobelman, Rebecca Rafshaw. We just pray that you would blanket them in, in uh, blessing and anointing them this day. We think of our military and Aaron Buckles. We think of our country, our leaders. And we pray, O oh Lord, that godly men would step forward and that you would fill these leaders' minds and hearts with Christ Jesus, O oh Lord. And we just pray, O oh Lord, also for our FLC. We thank you for the annual conference. We thank, thank you for leaders, godly men, leaders for that conference and, and for our FLC, that you would continue to guide and direct them, O oh Lord. And all these things, Lord, we just pray for VBS that's coming here middle of July and the VBS team. Prepare them, prepare their hearts, prepare those that are to attend, these children. And we just pray, O oh Lord, that, that you would anoint that, that VBS team and that session, O oh Lord, to your glory. Now, Lord, we pray for the, the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please receive the, the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift upon His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In closing, 511 in the Blue Hymnal.
is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior.